while it's impossible to create a completely foolproof industrial process, you can prioritize uptime by designing concepts like redundancy and resiliency into the system from the beginning, rather than adding them. As an afterthought, this approach is standard in the power industry, where it's universally agreed that the amount of acceptable downtime is none. The lights still go out, sometimes, but only after. A lot of things have gone wrong. Surprisingly, industries like water and wastewater often have a much higher tolerance for downtime, usually because of the perceived cost of actually doing something about it. Now, SCADA systems can use redundancy in a lot of ways to reduce downtime, but for now, let's focus on server failover, specifically hot backup failover. And when one server fails, another picks up where it left off without delay or human intervention. When people think about redundancy, this is how they imagine it works. Just like in this intro. But for real life systems, Redundancy looks more like like this. Uh, the server fails, hopefully someone notices, then they drive to site, boot up the backup computer, and hope that it's running a recent enough version of the application that it still talks to all their I.O. Worst of all, if that secondary server fails, then... Or they set up two redundant servers on a single virtual machine. Or two virtual machines in the same basement. Or spread servers across three offices. But use the same internet provider. Or a single VPN. In this segment, we will look at why even small companies and utilities need to integrate mission critical concepts like redundancy and resiliency into their industrial processes. <laughs> Here's a question. Is good enough good enough? And by that I mean, is a limp-home policy for your backup system in any industrial control system, is that actually good enough? Of course, the answer is, it depends. So here's my problem. I have one of those donut type spare wheels. It's a limp home spare wheel. Uh, some cars only have just the tire spray uh, to help you with the puncture. So that donut spare wheel is not rated to go over approximately 50 miles an hour. So I can't go on interstate. So really, when you start thinking about this, that donut spare wheel is a cold backup. So for a start, I'm down. This is my downtime. I'm, I'm in the car and I can't go anywhere. So then I take out my spare wheel. Spare wheel may or may not even, you know, be inflated right now. It may itself have a puncture. So that's the idea with a cold backup. It's not, it's not a great strategy because now I'm you know checking like this to see whether it's going to work or not and on top of that it does not give me equal performance what if the same thing the nail or the debris that took out one tire what if it takes out the second tire i've only one spare some of these are the issues that you run into when it comes to backups with industrial control systems and of course i can't keep adding wheels in here you know there's only so much room that I have so really it comes down to the suitability for what I'm doing so if I was going somewhere where I'm likely to get many punctures I should have multiple spare wheels or I need to have technology that is not going to have a puncture the aircraft industry employs multiple backup strategies just looking at the undercarriage alone you can actually see that there's multiple wheels and in reality an aircraft doesn't need all of those wheels to be able to perform a landing or a takeoff safely obviously the criticality of a system determines a lot of the time whether or not you're going to have redundant systems sometimes though it's just a perception a perception of cost or complexity 
that prevents people from going ahead and employing redundant systems. So how much downtime is acceptable? Now, odds are someone at your organization has already answered this question, either accidentally or on purpose. Uh, and the answer would basically come down to their perception of the cost of fixing the problem versus the cost of failure, uh, particularly if you're a smaller organization. Uh, now, we often pick on the water wastewater industry, but that's an industry that has traditionally accepted a higher amount of downtime uh, for just this reason. Uh, especially if you're a smaller utility uh, or if you uh, believe that you have an unimpeachable water supply. But over the last 20 years, I think we've already seen on either side of the border some examples of cases where these kinds of assumptions have led to some pretty tragic outcomes. So being a small utility doesn't spare you from the kind of regulatory compliance uh, of a big utility. And you're not exempt from paying big fines either. Okay, this is my bug out bag. Now, a few years ago, after watching The Walking Dead, uh, I decided that we kind of needed to be a little bit prepared in case we all had to get out of here in a hurry and stay somewhere for a couple of days. Um, so, preppers, don't judge me. I pared down what's in this bag quite a bit because I just want to make a point about redundancy versus resiliency. All right, so let's have a look. So uh, when survivalists talk about the uh, 10 C's of survival in the woods, uh, we're not going to talk about all of them, we're just going to focus on three, which is cutting, combustion, and cover. All right, so cutting, we've got this knife, um, it's a nice, sturdy, simple knife, it lives on my belt, I can get to it easily, um, I can use it to process firewood. I've also got this Leatherman, which is a bit heavy. Uh, but it's got every tool you'd ever need in that situation. So even though I pay a price, I get a benefit. So, And then I've got this cute little Swiss Army knife, which easily goes in my pocket. And that brings me to the point. Uh, they all don't go in my bag. As soon as I put the pack on, I put this in my pocket and this on my belt so that if I lose the bag or if I drop the knife, I've got backups uh, on my person in different ways. Now, the other fun bit of redundancy on the knife is in the handle, it has what they call a ferrocenium rod or a ferro rod. And what that is, is um, I use the knife, which uh, it travels with, and you scrape it along and make a spark and you can make uh, fire in the woods. So that's another handy uh, form of redundancy, which brings us to combustion. That's one form of combustion. The other is more traditional in this waterproof case full of waterproof matches, bit of overkill, which has a built-in striker. It's got some tinder inside. So it is itself a self-contained fire system. Everything's a system. And uh, also, as a, another layer, I've got uh, three boxes of wooden matches in a Ziploc bag that, again, live in the pack. So I've got three different kinds of combustion, all carried on me in different ways, all work in different ways. Finally, cover. Uh, we've got this nice poncho, uh, which is warm, uh, which keeps me dry, uh, but also I can uh, use some of this cordage and uh, another C and uh, hang up and make a really nice shelter that I can sleep under. And while I'm setting that up, I can wear the garbage bag, which I've pulled out and put in my pocket, uh, which can be used for a variety of different things, including a container. Um, so I could wear that as a raincoat while I'm setting up my cover for my uh, shelter. And then at night, uh, another form of cover is this little emergency bivy, which is basically one of those silver emergency blankets that looks like a sleeping bag. So again, I've got a bunch of different uh, ways of doing redundancy. Now let's go back to redundancy versus resiliency. So here I have three dollar store magnifying lenses, and uh, they're cheap, uh, they're light, uh, they're, they won't break very easily, and, uh, and you won't run out of them, so to speak, like you would with matches. Uh, now, I've added three of them. Have I added three new layers of redundancy to my system? Well, not if it's raining outside. And really, that's when I need it the most. So that's really what we're talking about. Uh, like my dad used to say, uh, when things go off the rails, they go off the rails. And it's unlikely that when something bad happens, it's only going to affect one part of your system. It can often knock out more than one. So more than one level of redundancy is important, but it's also important that you set it up in a way uh, that you don't have a single point of failure. So we can all agree that redundancy is important. Just bear in mind that this can mean a lot of different things to different people. So when someone tells you that your new system will include redundancy, 
it's up to you to figure out exactly what that includes so that you can be sure that will actually make your process resilient. For more information about mission-critical systems, visit vtscada.com.